Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, in the previous lecture, we have begun with uh, discussing some of the issues and problems which have been encountered and which in a sense necessitate for us to look at uh, why environment is one of the most growing concerns of uh, this present era and today in this lecture we are going to look at some of the principles of ecology and also to look at some of the various trends or the waves of environmentalism beginning from the 1960s, so that we have an idea how these environmental movements have evolved uh, over a period of time and what are the kind of issues which are being raised uh, regionally and globally and what are the initiatives they have taken. And uh, also, in this, uh, we will try to have much more of an idea before uh, beginning with the real, the content of the course. And uh, to begin with, we will just try to look at some of the uh, principles of, uh, some basic principles of ecology. And uh, yesterday, uh, in the previous class, we had given an overview, if not a brief uh, conceptual analysis of what ecology is, what environment is. Today, uh, in this lecture, we will be looking more into some of the basic principles of ecology. Now, I have just listed down some of the points and we will just look at it one by one. The first one says, all levels of organization overlap and interact. Now, in this, the whole ecosystem, some way or the other, in, uh, interact in different levels and that overlaps. Uh, any kind of action of one species has an arching uh, impact on the other. That is the level of how uh, different organizations of species uh, interact at different levels. And within these ecological systems, virtually everything is related to everything else, which means we cannot afford to see things uh, in isolation but in a more interrelated uh, manner. And thirdly, if you look at this, the abundance and distributions of living organisms on earth are affected by the aspects of the physical, biotic and the social environment. Now, when we say social environment, it is not just the human, even animals have their own social organizations and they do also reflect some kind of uh, how their physical aspects 
does have an influence on their social uh, organization. Now, in the fourth point, uh, these biotic communities differ in numbers and kinds of species, the diversities of species and the roles of ecological needs in the community. The geographical locations or habitations or environment does have uh, some kind of influences on the species that is uh, that, that particular ecological needs where the biotic inhabits. And in the fifth point, this species in, bi uh, in biotic communities form some kind of a network of relationships or symbiosis which may be either favorable or unfavorable for its species. For instance, if you classify and look at the animal kingdom, there are the herbivorous and carnivorous. Herbivorous are more dependent on plants for their means of livelihood, whereas carnivorous are more or less dependent on the other species of animals. Now, carnivorous in some sense are more you know uh, unfavorable for the other species and similarly even human whatever we consume if uh, consume in excess or maybe we are not able to meet the carrying capacity of that ecological niche which we have uh, discussed earlier will eventually pose a threat to the eco uh, ecological and will lead to ecological imbalances. Now, these different ecological communities have analogous components and may be similar in basic organization even though their constituent species are very different. No matter how different they are, they have some bit of a similar similarities in their basic organization. Now, the human populations, if you look at, are typically subject to certain ecological principles, although we artificially dissociate ourselves from other living systems all of our activities, whatever we do, how we uh, try to leave some kind of imprint on the environment and even our, the use of these advanced technologies are ultimately dependent on nature. Now, in the upcoming courses, we will also try to engage more in looking at the nature culture debate and how is nature evolving, the kind of perceptions, the kind of attitudes, knowledge societies have will engage more in depthly in the debate between nature and culture. Now, the biological interactions which are usually uh, multiple and cumulative and rarely if ever do interactions occur singly or in isolation as I had uh, discussed a species cannot be understood in isolation but some form of interactions do occur among different species. I will just try to categorize uh, into four how these ecosystems uh, are being uh, divided into different components which will to some extent provide a central theoretical premise in looking at ecology in a more 
general sense. Now, if you look at the first one that is the abiotic substances, it includes water, oxygen, nitrogen, extra, which are supposedly outside the living organism, but we can't survive and live without all this, which of course is also a basic part of our existence. And the second thing is the producers that is the green plants and bacteria which is uh, commonly known as autotrophic and these producers are on which we the living species rely on for the supply of a food chain system. And thirdly if you look at that is the consumers which uh, is more or less the organism, the living species which utilize organic materials which again is manufactured by the producers that is the heterotrophic. And finally, it is the decomposers that is bacteria and fungi which is known as saprophytic. Now, there is this constant interrelations between the producers, the consumers and decomposers. Now, if any of this is missing or there is inadequate or inefficiency on their part, this whole uh, basic components of our ecosystems will uh, become imbalanced. Now, uh, the fact remains that these ecosystems are in a sense self-regulating and does not mean that they are simple or stable or in a sense uh, inexhaustible or which cannot be uh, in a sense uh, destroyed, but there is the increase in this produces in a sense is said to create a positive feedback on consumers that is the living organism whereas the increase in consumers creates negative feedback on producers. Now, over here we can uh, try to look at or, or contextualize by looking at the relationship which are normally applied in economic system that is the demand and supply. Now, for instance, if there is too much of a demand and uh, lack in supply, there will be some kind of uh, a negative if not imbalances. So, there has to be a mutual or balance between the demand and supply and maybe if the supply is much more in higher position then it can have a positive feedback on the consumers. Now, uh, perhaps these pictures can best explain uh, which is of course a diagrammatic representation of how the terrestri terrestrial ecosystem which shows the producers, consumers and decomposers, how there is this linkages or interconnectedness among these basic components of our ecosystem. Now, if you look at this statistic or chart, this J shape, J shape curve of human population growth and over here the years are given. Now, over this span of 2000 years, human have encountered different kinds of disasters like some of them uh, to mention a few, uh, the black death plague which was uh, more or less between 
1200 to 1400 AD. And again, the World War II, uh, which was uh, in the late 1940s again. Now, all this to some extent have impacted on the human population, but yet the human population has increase and on the rise and on the in the light of this we can perhaps talk about how uh, Malthus tries to explain uh, the rise of population and he in fact uh, in a very uh, critical manner sees the occurrence of war as uh, a check or a measures to control this rise of this population. And he in fact sees the rise of population as a threat to the existence of mankind itself because the resources which we have might not be sufficient enough to meet the increasing demands of this rising population. Now, no doubt uh, Malthus does have many uh, critics as well and uh, there are many who do not really subscribe and agree to the kind of theory he posit in that uh, the population theory. Now, this ecosystem homeostasis refers also to a relative balance of nutrient cycles energy flows and species and composition in the ecosystem which of course uh, we have seen in that diagram how the provider consumer and uh, uh, the composer all these interrelationships are being seen. Now moving on to the other the second part that is by looking at what are the trends if not the environmental movements uh, which have been witnessed in the second half of the 20th century and which of course began in the west. Now prior to this period of 1960s the environmentalism focus mostly on preservation of wilderness and conservation of resources. Now, what is this preservation of wilderness and conservation? This idea of environmentalism developed as a result of preserving the nature outside the human touch, so that this nature remain untouched and uh, more or less in the southern countries that is uh, mostly in the third world countries this idea of uh, preservation of wilderness if not wilderness thinking is being strongly uh, criticized because it is seen to be more of uh, the ecology of affluence because uh, this preservation of wi wilderness or wilderness thinking is serving only the purpose of the developed or developed societies. So, it does not really have much of an application uh, to the third world countries. Nevertheless, this idea of wilderness thinking if not conservation of resources are being borrowed and if you look around maybe in the context of India at least the tiger reserve projects whatever we have the national parks and uh, the sanctuary so and so forth all these things are more or less being borrowed from the western culture from this idea of uh, the environmentalism which uh, focus entirely on preservation of wilderness and conservation of resources. 
Now, if we elaborate this a little further, now Ramchandra Guha and uh, Martinez, they tries to give a critique of this because by trying to uh, give a boundary of the north and south, which is known to be uh, ecology, ecology of the affluence and environmentalism of the poor, wherein third con in third world countries mostly people are pretty much dependent on the surrounding environment and resources, which in a sense is a uh, basic sustenance for them. Now, when this idea of uh, preserving or conservation of uh, resources has stemmed in, now many of uh, those communities who are pretty much dependent on these surroundings are being denied access to this. So, in a sense it poses some kind of a threat not only to their means of uh, livelihood, but also the kind of uh, traditional rights which they have on these uh, resources. That is when I talk about resources, it means land, water and forest. Uh, and in, in the Hindi parlance, it is called to be Jal Jungle and Jamin. Now, these environmental movements which flourished in the 1960s in the midst of the civil rights, peace and women's movement. Now, uh, around this time, there was uh, a book which was published by Russell Kersons, uh, which of course the title is The Silent Spring, which in a sense awakens or brought to the public attention the multiple dangers of environmental pollution to public health such as the use of DDT and also sparked the beginning of modern environmentalism. Now, the use of these chemicals or fertilizers in order to maximize the output or product, especially in agriculture for example, this whole idea is nothing but which has been conceived from the post or industrialization process, because nature is seen to be commodified and where it has to be, uh, the more you exploit the more abundantly, you tends to uh, have uh, sort of the output or the harvest. Now, the past few decades, India also witnessed similar kind of uh, sort of changes in terms of our agriculture practices, uh, mention may be made of the green revolution. Now, as a result of green revolution, no doubt the food supply has increased abundantly, but in many states like Punjab and Haryana, where these green revolutions has taken place, there are some case studies which are being done and they face a kind of environmental problems related to the fertility of the soil. Now, many of those agriculture fields have become desertified. The nutrients and fertility of the soil has gone down and being uh, more or less become barren because of excessive use of chemicals and fertilizers. And these are some of the issues which have been encountered. And, and of course, the growing concern of the environmental pollution, not just to the public health, but the carrying capacity of 
a geographical space is a growing concern and this book in essence can be said to be a part breaking because it sort of awakened the idea or the perceptions humans have towards uh, the environment. Now, there is also this uh, the phase of new environmentalism that is beginning from the 1960s. Now, as a result of this, people became more aware of environmental issues such as air and water pollution, radiation, pesticides, poisoning and other problems. They demand the federal government to take more responsibility or to act more responsibly. Now, if you take the examples of pollution, pollution also has surface differently in uh, different parts of the world. In developed countries, pollution is seen to be a threat because it affects the health of the affluent societies. Whereas, in the third world countries, pollution is also to be seen in terms of the kind of uh, dependence people has. For instance, uh, the use of chulha for instance, the amount of smoke it incurred cannot really be categorized and seen to be a pollution from the environmental perspective. Therefore, whenever we try to highlight certain kind of environmental problems, it has to be read and can contextualize. Therefore, it will have a rational interpretation because we cannot afford to borrow the idea which evolved and circled around in the western culture. And no doubt uh, continuing with the environmental uh, problems uh, the issues of 1960s, there is a growing public concern for the environment because uh, there are some uh, initiatives which are being taken for example, uh, beginning from 1970s, uh, this art day has been uh, sort of observe and today like if you look at globally on this very occasion so to say there is a, a growing awareness and increasing uh, initiatives which are taken by individuals maybe in the state in the locality or regionally and then maybe for instance you can mention about putting off light for few hours in a sense is a steps which are being initiated or taken up in order to conserve the resources of the earth. Now, the new environmentalism is in a sense a response to the environmental movement where several laws emerges to regulate environmental pro, uh, pollutions and protect the natural resources. Right? Now, some of the most important laws or legislations or regulations which are being <coughs> passed, uh, maybe we can cite the examples of the Mississippi River, how it is being managed. Now, for instance, the National Environmental Policy Act that is NEPA of 1969 and also you take the case of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, the FWPCA 1972 and you can also take the under Mississippi River Management Act UMRAMA of 1986. Now, all this policy are in essence being uh, initiated in order to maintain a healthy 
river riverine ecosystem and uh, I'll just read out one of the act of uh, the national environmental policy of 1969 which says that the purpose of this act are to declare national policy which will encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment to promote efforts which will prevent or eliminate damage to the environment and biosphere and stimulate the health and welfare of man to enrich the understanding of ecological system and natural resources important to the nation and to establish <coughs> a council of environmental equality which is uh, borrowed from section 2 of that uh, act. Now, if you give a closer examination to this act, the policy is designed in order to sort of uh, promote a healthy relationship between man and environment. Now, remember many of the rivers uh, today if you look at are being polluted as a result of uh, careless uh, disposition of industrial waste and also the irresponsible act of uh, the humans uh, dumping of any kinds of uh, objects. Now, many of the river system or riverine system which we have are today un being under threat and which needs to further uh, design a policy so that the we humans in a sense are being uh, to responsibly act in preserving uh, our environment. Now, what is the kind of resurgence which has been witnessed in the post 1960s? <coughs> well, <coughs> there is an increase in the scientific understanding maybe uh, there has been much more of uh, a research which are being <coughs> conducted in this uh, uh, domain and uh, which of course can be seen from the kind of research publications in academic and also there is an increase in pressure group membership for instance in the Greenpeace, Amnesty, the World Wild, uh, Wildlife Foundation. Now, there is a growing uh, urgency if not a realization from citizens from different nation states and they try to uh, participate if not uh, initiate some kind of exercise by being a member of any of these group and volunteer themselves so that one step which is being taken by a single individual will make a lot of difference in a wider uh, domain. Now, there has been also an increasing science of damage and which of course uh, can be seen from the satellite images, flooding, oil spills, acid rain. And there is an increased desire to find solutions which of course is being uh, again initiated by the medias and of course there is much more of a wider media attention in this domain and there is also a growing rise in the public interest in related to the environmental concerns. Now, again moving on in the post 1970s as I had mentioned the first art day was being observed uh, and 
the Greenpeace have uh, the initiation uh, of the Greenpeace have kick started in 1971 and we all I hope we all know like uh, what the Greenpeace are up to and the polluters in a way pays principles by this OECD in 1971 is also being uh, initiated and globally there is this the UN conference on human development uh, which was organized in 1972 the world watch institute of 1975 perhaps all this development in a sense can be uh, termed as a growing awareness or an increased or a step towards uh, the increasing uh, rise of environmental concerns. Now, if you look at this the period of 1970s, there is to some extent a limit in the growth debate like for instance uh, in 1972 the club of Rome report and uh, in that there was two main conclusions and the first one is if the present trends in growth of population, industrialization, pollution, food production and resource depletion continued unchanged, if, if it goes into this pace, the limits to growth on this planet would be reached within the next 100 years. Now, the main concern is the limits to growth because every uh, parts of the ecosystems has their own limits that is carrying capacity. Now, once that carrying capacity is crossed or lapsed, there will be an imbalance and this is exactly what the Club of Rome report uh, talked about. Now, in the second, uh, it, it, it talks about it is possible to alter these growths, trends and to establish a condition of ecological and economic stability that is sustainable for the future. Now, this question of uh, sustainability is being raised in order to establish ecological the condition of ecological and economic stability. Now, if you look at uh, the kind of the pace of exploiting or use of resources has increased dramatically in the post industrialization period simply because to expand the industry there is a growing need for raw materials and natural resources has to be exploited in a very rapid and increasing manner and if this is the case will will it be possible to have a sustainable future. For instance, if you take the example of uh, let us say the fishing in the marine, the kind of uh, trawler which is being used in order to catch or get hold of the fish is different from the traditional methods of fishing, which is seems to be much more less harmful and then sustainable. But the use of machines like trawlers has a far reaching and impact on the biodiversity of uh, the water bodies. Now, we need to differentiate the kind of action which we as a humans are uh, in a sense committing towards nature. So, this debate 
has to be brought into in order to look at some of the uh, problems which we are facing. Now, when I say problems, uh, I mean to say the ecological and environmental problems which we are facing now. Now, if you look at the past few decades have actually witnessed different kinds of the intensity of these ecological disasters can be uh, seen. Uh, we, 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 I am sure we all must be aware uh, in and around us uh, regionally and globally the kind of ecological disasters which the world actually have witness. Now, I just I will just mention few of these uh, incidents the way back in 1978 there was an oil spill in the coast of Britannia that is the Amoco Cadiz oil spill which actually have caused a lot of destruction and threat to the uh, biodiversity of the marine. Now, again in 1979, the three mild island nuclear accident occurs in Pennsylvania. Now, the magnitude of these disasters have a far reaching impact on the human society and these are nothing but a man made disaster which in a sense could have been avoided. In the previous uh, lecture, I had talked about mentioned about some of the environmental natural disasters like the tsunamis, earthquake, so and so forth, which in a sense is beyond the control of human. Now, in that case, if you look at there is a link between what is a natural disasters and what is man made disasters right now citing an example of again the 1984 bhopal gas tragedy in india as a result of the union carbide toxic chemical leak which eventually led to the deaths of thousands of people and more than 3 lakhs or 3 millions injured and there has been an ongoing uh, case wherein those people who are being affected has even approached the Supreme Court so that a compensation be given to those affected families and members. So, these are the kind of uh, magnitude of disasters which are of course been witnessed uh, in the past few decades and God forbid maybe in the future like this sort of uh, magnitude may increase. Now, if you look at the 1980s again, what are the growing concerns the globally? What are the kind of issues which are being raised? Now, the climate change is something which is uh, being hotly debated and talked about globally and there has been an extensive research in academic trying to look at what are the wider implications of this climate change across communities across nations. In 1985, the global warming was predicted and there has been an increasingly uh, a feeling that global warming in a sense has uh, affected uh, even those uh, people who are being uh, based inhabited inhabiting the rural hinterland or the rural villages. And the 1988 IPCC was established. And secondly, the ozone depletion was talked about because in 1985 again, 
the ozone hole was discovered and in 1987 as a result of this the Montreal protocol was adopted. Now, why is this uh, climate change and the ozone depletion again is uh, an environmental concern for us because it will have a far reaching implications and impact on not just our well being, but on the kind of uh, our means of survival and existence as a human on this planet. Now, again in 1980, there was a growing uh, concern and need to discuss sustainable development and as a result of this, the world conservation strategy come up with a definition where I quote uh, which I will read out that humanity's relationship with the biosphere that is the thin covering of the planet that contains and sustain life. So, we will continue to deteriorate. Now, mark this deteriorate until a new international order is achieved, a new environmental ethic is adopted, human populations stabilize and sustainable modes of development become the rule rather than exception. For development to be sustainable, it must take account of social and ecological factor as well as economic ones of the living and non-living resource base and of the long term as well as short term advantages and disadvantages of alternative actions. Over here in this particular definitions, we can actually uh, look at three important which I feel uh, things. Now, the first one is the environmental ethics. What kind of ethics we as humans or as a society has followed? The ethics and principles which has been a guiding principle concerning the environmental relations which we will share. And of course, this environmental ethics will be uh, broadly discussed in the upcoming lectures and which of course is a part of this uh, particular course. And secondly, in order to have uh, a sustainable development, it is also important to take the social and ecological factors and again this is the second uh, point which will be discussed in this course, because we will be more concerned of the uh, cultural ecological approaches and by taking the case study of few societies, we will be able to have an idea of how important this social and ecological factor is in order to have a sustainable development. And finally, the idea of these alternative actions or alternative way out needs to be one of the growing concerns of this uh, time. Now, in recent times as I had discussed in the previous lectures about why is the there is a growing concern and necessity of incorporating if not adopting or the coexistence of the knowledge and the wisdom of the traditional societies could perhaps be one way of an alternative in looking at this. Now, this world conservation strategy uh, has a very deep message and meanings which we as a humans are 
pretty much responsible to take an action. Now, there is another uh, definitions of sustainable development again uh, in 1987 uh, which was given by the world commission on environment and development now which talks about again equates sustainable development the equity or equitable distribution of resources or if not how do we maintain an ecological justice and what is ecological justice. Now, this WCED definitions uh, of sustainable development talks about equate sustainable development with progress which means to meet, to meet the needs of the present without compromising of the present uh, and the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, it is important for us to not only think our narrow gains, but also be concerned about the future, what beholds our future. And if it has to be an equitable distribution of resources, the question is, how many sections of the world population actually have uh, control over these resources and which section of the human societies are more in a advantages or in a more uh, better positions to have access to these environmental resources. These are some of the issues which needs to be taken up and discussed. Uh, partly I will try to engage in discussing all this more elaborately in the upcoming lectures. Now, for the time being, uh, let us also have a relook at some of the development in the post 1980s. Now, in May 1995, uh, the UK's sustainable development so strategy was published again with eight meanings uh, to define what sustainable development is and comes up with uh, four objectives. Now, the first objective talks about social progress which recognizes the needs of everyone. Now, in a sense this also talks about equitable distribution of resources, because we need to reframe and focus on the social progress and recognizes the needs of everyone and not just a few sections of a society. And in the next point, it also talks about the effective protection of the environment. How do we initiate uh, exercise in order to protect the environment or what kind of strategy should be developed, so that the environment is less affected or the kind of actions and imprints which we have on this planet is being minimized. Now, the third one says the prudent use of natural resources that is to use natural resources in a more sustainable and in a more judicious manner. Now, the maintenance of these high and stable levels of economic growth and employment also should be one of the basic objectives of the uh, this strategy which was initiated by uh, the country in the UK. Now, as I had discussed in the previous slide, now 
how do we talk about uh, equitable distribution or if not is there any ecological justice being uh, practice. If you look at this statistic at the moment the richest that is one fifth of the population globally receives around 82.7 percent of the total world income. Whereas, the poorest that is one fifth receives only 1.4 percent. Now, these are some of the statistic which in a sense has been pretty much eye opening and which actually shows that there is an increasing needs to locate the crux of the problem. The crux of the problems lies in this uh, equitable distribution and ecological justice. Now, in the case of uh, India like for example, if you take a few examples who are actually benefiting from the income by utilizing the resources only few corporates or companies the Ambani's, the Tata's, the Birla's a few of them just a handful of them are actually benefiting from the utilization of these resources and again this is some of the rising concerns which we need to focus. Therefore, this some of these growing concerns today is the ecological justice, the growing unequal distribution of resources which we have just uh, seen from the statistics. Now, there is also another concern which is uh, known as environmental racism. That is one section of the society is being treated as not really an outcast, but there is uh, an injustice being done to them. For instance, this particular term is being uh, explained in the context of Northern America, where the pollutions and toxic items are usually being dumped in and around the surroundings of those uh, black peoples. Now, if you take the examples of even the Indian context, uh, the, there has been uh, a strategy to dump the uh, pollutions and toxic items, the waste to the neighborings of the slum dwellers. Now, which in a sense is uh, not a social justice let alone keep aside the ecological justice, but the social justice which are being normally initiated by the government policy makers. Now, these are some of the growing concerns which we need to in a sense be concerned of. And finally, there is a growing concern of the indigenous peoples in terms of protecting their land and resources. Because if you take the examples of mining and also some of the uh, constructions of dams have actually been seen to be a new form of colonialism or in essence a colonizing attitude which are being initiated by the state, pon state sponsor uh, development projects. This again 
in a sense pose a threat not just to the means of livelihood or existence of the indigenous people but also the urging needs to recognize their rights now these are some of the growing concerns not just uh, in the indian context but it is a major concern globally and which should in a way be addressed if we are actually serious about delivering what is being enshrined in the WCED about sustainable development. Now, how serious are we in the maintaining sustainability or sustainable development is yet to be seen, but perhaps the growing concerns is in a sense posing antithetical to whatever we are engaging into. Yeah, uh, as discussed, these are some of the growing concerns uh, currently and uh, in art summit in 1992, there was five agreements which were introduced and the first one talks about the framework convention on climate change and the second talks about the convention on biodiversity agenda 21 the rio declarations the forest principles again here there has been uh, a changes or maybe reframing of the forest policies which we have but then if you take the examples of uh, the Indian context, the forest policies which we are following now does have its root or if not uh, which, are, which are being carried forward right from the colonial period. And we need to really look at some of these policies because whatever we follow now today might not necessarily address uh, the needs of the citizens or communities for instance. Uh, forest policies needs to be reframed and relook so that it meet the needs of uh, the citizens. Now, in brief what we have discussed so far is uh, the 1960s have given a birth the new consciousness of movements and there is an emerging groups uh, organization which are formed uh, because of environmental concerns and also in the 1970s there has been a tense battleground between the economists and the environmental movement and no doubt this uh, debate and fight will continue and in the 1980s the concept of this sustainable development has been introduced and since then there has been uh, a different meanings and a different definitions uh, concerning this sustainable development and also in the 1990s again there is a uh, <clears throat> a much more wider concern about sustainable development and in the post 2000 era we have rich estates where and how to move ahead this is just a pictures uh, a diagram to show you uh, about the interconnections and which in a way could have deliver some kind of a sustainability. Now, the question and one of the main uh, idea of uh, this course would be to find an alternative development that is to find uh, a way out. How do we move out or how do we tackle this ecological crisis which we are facing now. There is an urgent need for alternatives and